Do you remember that feeling that you got when you learnt to play your first ever deep strategic Euro game? Or are you someone who's currently standing at the edge of the precipice deciding whether to take the leap of faith or not? Well, games like Carcassonne, Catan and Ticket to Ride are some of my favourite gateway board games to introduce to players who are interested in playing more deeper Euro games. Ah, uh, dude, someone's just raided our entire board game collection. They've taken Carcassonne, Settlers of Catan, as well as my favorite version of Ticket to Ride, Ticket to Ride Europe. I'm just using them in this board game video I'm making. Oh, I was just about to put them on the swap and meet side and was just about to sell them. Yeah, I guess... Yeah, see ya. What makes those three games incredibly unique is the idea that all three games are relatively easy to teach, they provide players with actions that have incredible scope, as well as having a theme that players can really dig their teeth into. However, I want to let you in on a secret. There are other board games out there that allow players to dabble in some of the mechanics that are commonly seen in Euro board games, and that's what this video is all about. Hey dude, are you ready to play this awesome Euro game? Yeah, sure. I've always really wanted to play a Euro game, but I've never really had the chance to. Uh, just give me a sec while I set it up. Step one. Place the obelisk in the center of the game board. So this game spans across multiple so rounds. The dice around this obelisk will depend on where the shadow of the obelisk The status of that die will change as we play So the on game. your turn, you'll pick a die from around this obelisk. You'll then take the die and place it on your scales, which matches the symbol, ensuring that everything remains balanced. Uh, let me check what this piece does again. Because that's the ultimate key of the game. Balance. In condition. And when you perform the produce resources action, the colour of the die determines which of these cool 3D resources that are ordered from Etsy you'll get to produce. To score victory points, you'll need to play this mini side game on the edge of this board, which will then influence the markers that will make them go around this entire victory point track. Uh, Danny, do you think we could start with something slightly easier? How about this gateway game for new Euro gamers? Splendid. Let's play! Playing Splendor is like picking food from a Las Vegas buffet. Want that juicy emerald producing mine? Well trade for it first before the next customer in line does it. The game is a microcosm of intimate economic actions where players race to build the most efficient gem system first. Players try to acquire cards from three different levels by paying the right gem cost in the form of these weighted poker chips and whatever gem producing cards that they have in front of them. Become efficient enough and you might be able to see the best gem dealers and attract nobility and before you know it, you might just become the next Tiffany & Co of the board gaming world. Splendor is an excellent gateway Euro game for many reasons. First of all, the game is super easy to teach and this pure economic engine building system that the game offers players creates a really fast, highly tense interactive game of trying to nab all the victory points first. I love the fact that these uh, yellow chips are wild and you can kind of opt to decide to pick one of those rather than take the other chips of your choice and try to build a tableau of gem actions where the certain gem combinations that you have are going to help make these higher end cards a lot more cheaper and being able to attract those nobles first is going to help you accelerate to that finish line and hopefully get you that win. So you're saying that if I trade in a tile placement, a dice activation and a castle themed board game, I could upgrade it to a really good Euro game? Well why didn't you tell me sooner? World's Fair is a colourful game reminiscent of a rural funfair filled with vivid colour and excitement. It's a deceptively great Euro game where players are sending their supporters to five different exhibits around the board hoping to influence the inventors that are showcasing there. It's a game of area control and dominance. Have the greatest number of supporters in a region and get to claim a medal, as well as the ability to convert your exhibit cards into these colourful tokens. The aim of the game is to try and acquire as many of these colourful tokens as possible, and creating as many diverse sets as possible. The richer your set of tokens are, the more points you'll earn at the end of the game. However, players will need to beware because as people take a ride around the Ferris wheel, players will quickly understand that these offers are a limited time only. 
When I first stumbled upon World's Fair 1893, its colours and theme really stood out to me and so I acquired it, put it on my shelf and forgot it for about three or four years until it was my honeymoon and I decided to take this game away and play it. And boy, was I impressed. This is a brilliant small box Euro game. I really like how this Euro game dabbles in this area control aspect really well and really deeply. And often when you play area control games, it often is themed around soldiers or units that have to occupy certain territories. But here, it's all about people supporting different inventions that are being showcased at this World Fair. And it feels really thematic in that sense. I do feel like that players are always torn in the decisions that they make. You really want to have dominance in a particular area that you want to score and get exhibit tokens for, whilst a lot of the exhibit cards that are displayed around the wheel often appear in other exhibit sections, meaning that if you really want to excel in manufacturing, you still have to dabble a little bit in electricity to be able to get the exhibit card that's featured here so that you can then convert them at the end of the round into those tokens. And that balancing effect is a beautiful mechanism because it means the choices that you make are going to be constantly torn and the fact that there are three other players vying for those same positions just adds this huge dynamic element to the game. I really also like the set collecting aspect where you can't just dabble in one particular region and you've really got to spread yourself out in order to be able to uh, increase and maximize the points that you're going to get. Uh, dude, what's going on here? I'm trying to solve a crime here. Someone played these board games and didn't even bother packing them up. I mean, what sort of human being doesn't sleeve their board game cards when they play them for the first time? Board games are great at making you spend money. So much money, in fact, that it's naturally fitting that this next Euro game has you dabbling in auctioning and tile placing. Isle of Sky is a tile auctioning game that looks like it's stolen its DNA from Carcassonne and rebranded itself as a more expensive and more elaborate Carcassonne. Here players take on the role of chieftains as they draw three tiles, show them off like some sort of prize cow and then set prices to two of them before axing the other. This game is reminiscent of going to the market, buy your beetroots, set at your opponent's prices, keep everything cheap and you'll find that you'll become the next board game Walmart. Make them too expensive and you'll find yourself being right out of pocket. It's a game ultimately about setting the right price that keeps all of your customers happy. After customers acquire their tiles, they get placed on your map, representing your territory. Meet the current round objectives to score big points. Connect your castle to the brewery and everybody is happy. And wealthy too, I might add. What I really like about this game and why I recommend it for gateway Euro gamers is the fact there's a multi-level and sequential way that this game takes place through its rounds. The idea that each round players are going to be able to see all of the options and all of the tiles that are available to them and then they get to choose one each and get rid of it. And that whole multi-step process and hidden process really adds a huge interactive element and social element to the game. When players reveal their screens and it's revealed how much each of those tiles are going to cost, players have to weigh up first of all how much money that they have in hand, literally, as well as whether they're willing to commit that money to buy a tile off another player because if they don't, those tiles go to that player. And that creates for some really tough choices that players are going to have to make. Not only do players have to negotiate the auctioning element, but players are also going to have to build efficient routes, satisfy these really cool win conditions um, on alternating rounds, and also making sure that they've got this beautiful economy system where their trail of coins leads from their castle, so they've got enough money to spend each and every game. So there's this really undercurrent of intense competition that emanates through each and every decision that you make in this game. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's auction. Up for sale today we have this amazing board game by acclaimed designer Alexander Pfister. Who would like to make an opening bid? Jeez, get your own Alexander Pfister game. Crikey! Never has there ever been a game so uniquely named. It's like they tried to avoid calling it Medium Town or for goodness sakes Ginormous Town. Little Town is a simple worker placement game that introduces the concept of gathering resources in a focused way. It's so simple. Place your worker on the grid, 
acquire all of the resources in every grid square surrounding, and there you have it, a mathematical board game equation. However, this is a game so far from any mathematical Cartesian plane you've ever encountered in your high schooling. It's a game where you buy properties, place them on the grid strategically, and hope other people come and use them. It's pure genius, and it also is a great twist. You can earn cash when people trigger the action on your buildings, or you can piggyback on your opponent's conversion engine to generate food and resources for your people. The twist on the worker placement mechanic in this game is spatially and economically interesting. Why I like Little Town as a gateway Euro game is because it teaches you how worker placement works, but it does so in a simple yet interesting and unique and different way to a lot of other worker placement games. Here, the geography of the map and the grid of the map really matters. In other games where you use worker placement, these are often used to occupy spaces that are already set out for you on the board thus blocking other players from activating that space. Here, the grid creates open little pockets for you to place your workers, and then you gain all of the resources and actions that are around, including the diagonal spaces around that particular space, meaning that you are able to create a really cool geographical resource engine that can be used to purchase really high buildings, monuments, and also gain those victory points at the end of the game. I really love the spatial element to this game and the geography of the board changes with each and every play. Also the combination of buildings uh, can also change as well and the game comes with a cool building drafting variant where you can pick the buildings you're going to use for the round and then that changes every time you play. Cube pushing is a common thing that happens in many Euros. Move the cube up the track to gain a resource or bonus, spend a resource and move your cubes back down. It's all part of the crunchy Euro experience. Imhotep takes the idea of moving cubes around, literally, as players load boats with their stones and send them off to different locations, for them only to be unloaded to create monuments and score players victory points. There's something ingenious about Imhotep though. It's up to players to decide which boat they want to load their stones into, and which boats they want to send off on their merry way. This creates for some interesting social situations where every plan you set up could go pear-shaped, or shall I say, boat-shaped. It's all about piggybacking. Hop on the right ferry and your friend over there just might let you get a point or two. And that, folks, is beautiful. What I really like about this stepping stone game, pun included, is the fact that there's multiple scoring opportunities in this game, which allows players to tailor their game strategy to discover different avenues for maximizing the points and for winning the game. What I really love is that there's a huge dichotomy of choice that this game offers to players. Do you place your stone so that you fill up one boat with all of your stones and risk that boat being placed by another player at another location? Or do you piggyback onto a boat that someone else has placed their stone on? I also really like the different scoring opportunities. Like in the temple, it's basically based on the top view of the line of blocks that are placed on there. Whereas in the burial chamber, it's how many connected blocks of the same color. With the pyramid, you're building up and scoring points as you do so. The obelisk is simply just trying to build the tallest possible. The market just offers a whole plethora of different cards, whether you're going for the long-term strategy of collecting all the statues or using the abilities to maybe expand, you know, how many cubes you can store on your little cart. This game has a lot of different options, but it all funnels those options into a nice crescendo. I think it's time to do your tax return, and I don't think you can claim meeples as a deduction like you did last year. Oh man, I hate doing my tax. I'd rather play an awesome Euro instead. So at the end of the game, with every unsold good tile that I own, I get one victory point. For every remaining silverling that I have, I get one victory point. And for every two worker tiles, I get one victory point. And then I score my yellow hexagonal tiles, where for every church that I get, I get four victory points. And then for every carpentry workshop that I have, I get four victory points. And because I've got two carpentry workshops on my map, I get to score eight victory points. Many Euro games have you converting resources, often represented by cubes, into other resources, also often represented by cubes. In tiny towns, you get to place resources on your board, represented by cubes, and convert them into buildings, represented by building shapes, of course. It's a bingo-style game where each player gets the opportunity to name a resource that all players need to place on their board. 
Be strategic and position your cubes into the right geometric arrangement. The faster you create buildings and the more space you'll free up. Get choked up and your town will be a tiny town of absolute rubble. Tiny Towns is a board game that reminds me of a box of assorted chocolates. Pick your favourite chocolates and you might develop a good winning strategy to earning the most victory points. What I really like about this game and why I recommend it as a gateway Euro game is the fact that players are gathering resources. They're trying to solve this puzzle of putting their resource cubes into this restrictive 4x4 grid and then converting those resources into buildings which then, if they're placed in the right spot, can earn certain victory points. There's a whole range of different branching opportunities to gain the victory points that you need and to maximise them over the other players. I really like the element of players announcing the resources that everyone at the table will need to place and that can really create for some really cool situations. Do you place the resources that you don't need in one side of the board whilst you develop the resources that you want on the other side of the board? Or do you just work with what you're given? The variable building strategy and scoring strategy and placement strategy really adds for some great variability to the game, including the use of the monument cards, which kind of gives players asymmetric scoring abilities. Euro games are often themed around some of the most spectacular and culturally diverse places around the world. In Istanbul, players wander the markets trying to sell goods to ultimately gain a substantial collection of rubies to win the game. Players will move their stack of discs and leave some behind as they activate different locations around the game area. This might involve expanding their wheelbarrow, gathering goods, visiting the post office, trading coins in for rubies, or even dabbling in on the black market. Wherever players go, there are deals to be made. Make the right ones to carve the pathway to victory. A lot of heavy Euro games often offers players a plethora of different options to take on their turn. Sometimes the options can feel a little bit overwhelming. Istanbul is a really great stepping stone Euro game because it offers players a great level of options without making them feel like they're sinking underwater. What I really like about Istanbul is the fact that all players are fighting and competing for a common goal, and that is to collect these juicy red rubies first. However, how players get to that destination is going to be different and unique each and every time. First of all, in Istanbul, I really like how each of the different locations in the market can be reconfigured each and every game. Each location has its own unique way of earning money, earning resources, or gaining extra abilities to expand your wheelbarrow, or even getting what you need in order to acquire those rubies. I also like the spatial element of having to move your stack of merchants around and leaving an assistant behind and try to acquire cards and the right combination of things that you need to succeed. What really makes this a beautiful Euro game is the idea that there's a lot of strategic thinking without the heaviness of trying to learn a lot of different rules. The turns are relatively simple and the ways that the locations can be manipulated is actually quite flexible and open each time. Engine building in Euro games has nothing to do with cars, but rather to do with toying with what you have and making it grow and work for you. Century Spice Road is a game that does just that. Play with your spice and upgrade it through trade and hopefully your victory will grow. It's a deck building game where players are acquiring different action cards into their hand and then playing them out to create a series of chaining effects with the ultimate goal of gathering the right combination of spices to acquire the scoring cards available. It's a game about exploring the right synergies and discovering the right efficiencies in doing what you need to do really makes this game such a great gateway Euro game is the fact that it focuses on developing players' ability to build a really great resource engine by using their hand of cards. Players will start with a basic hand of cards and then slowly acquire these extra cards which helps the efficiency of trading certain spices into other spices that they need. I love the hierarchy effect that this game offers where one spice can be converted to other spices and those spices can be converted into more um, valuable spices. It's almost like you're at the market trading different coloured cubes. I really like the synergy and the combos that can occur in this game where you might have a card that creates green cubes and then the green cubes can then be transferred into other yellow and red cubes and then those spices can be used to be transferred into other spices. There's this whole sense of engine building that emanates throughout this game. Scary spice. Ginger spice. Baby spice. Sporty spice. Posh spice. 
Thank you once again for joining me for another Board Game Sanctuary video. If you love Euro games as much as I do, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button and subscribe for some more amazing board game content which are sure to come your way. If you really want to connect with the Board Game Sanctuary community, don't forget to head over to my Patreon page or my Facebook page and start a conversation there. This is Danny Sunny out. I'll see you next time and I look forward to bringing you some more awesome board game reviews. See you later.